I will be um, looking at it live though. I'll try to watch it a little bit when other people are speaking, but I will see it afterwards because this is going to be recorded. Actually, let me put turn it on now. Let's see. Ah, we are recording already. I didn't even realize it. I got your back. I got your back. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh, good. Well, some of the stuff I said, I didn't know if I went on recording, but I guess it's on now. <laughs> but no, I got the good part. <laughs> oh, the good I knew part. when to press a button. <laughs> <laughs> you know me well enough when, to anticipate when the, you know, when the attitude comes out. <laughs> right. No, it's fun. But um, so we will be kicking off in a few moments. A whole bunch of people coming in right now. So now. Um, if I would appreciate it if you um, if you have any questions and stuff, I would say because of the flow of this program, it'd be great to kind of save them to the end. Um, I will have some time at the end for any questions you want to jump in with. Um, but the chat you can chat throughout. But if uh, you put it in the chat, we may not get to it till later. So that's the only heads up I would give. Um, but of course. You know, um, people can uh, respond to each other, but I can't 100% promise I will respond to that right away, of course. So we said 10 a.m. and I see a whole bunch of people coming in. So we'll start in a few minutes. I am in Independence, Missouri, in case you all are wondering where I'm at down south of Kansas City. Harry Truman, um, you know, grew up not far from here, about maybe 20 miles or so on a farm. Well, in the early part of his youth, but later when he enrolled in school, he came actually here to Independence. And um, so he grew up both in a farm outside of here and in town here in Independence. And we'll get more into some of the buildings around me today as we go through the program. But it's a beautiful town, it really is. I mean, it was re I really enjoyed walking around yesterday, very charming, a lot of historic buildings. And um, it, as I mentioned in one of my posts yesterday, this is also where multiple trails started. So the Santa Fe Trail went here to Santa Fe, the California Trail, and the Oregon Trail. So I'm sure some of you all played that game, Oregon Trail. Um, well, here we are, where it actually begins, in Independence, Missouri. So there's a lot of history here, not just related to Truman, but related to, you know, many aspects of this country and the movement west. Uh, and as many of you know, I used to live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I used to live in California. So I, I grew up in California. So it's kind of cool. I'm on the other end <laughs> of both those trails, but um, I don't have Oregon down yet, so I can't claim all three, but I can claim two of the three. So I think that's pretty good. Um, and uh, so it's really fascinating just to kind of see all the history that's in this town. And that's the kind of stuff that I like is to go scope out interesting spots that maybe aren't, you know, on the first page of the tour book, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're doing major travel. Got to get beyond the major cities. Even though I love the major cities and get into these towns and find so many things. Now, also in Independence, in addition to the Truman home that we're going to check out today um, is the Truman Presidential Library, which is just um, not far in the town. And that's a separate entity. Um, and of course, that was built after his presidency. So different thing, right? home is before he was president and, and nobody knew he was going to become president of course and you'll learn a little more, more about that in the presidential libraries after so they're different entities different um things that they're interpreting so if you do make your way out here you could really spend a lot of time between the truman home which has a couple of buildings not just the home the presidential library and if you drove out to the farm um you can also see that you have three things related to truman right there and the trails that I just described, the three trails, that's pretty packed. And you can walk around, it's, like I said, it's a charming area to walk around. And I'm sure 
there's other historical things you would find too that are more local in historic nature. So really, really cool. I'll just give a few more minutes here because I still see people are coming in. We'll kick it off. Getting Any very close. Well, go ahead. I was just saying. I have to say you're, get, you're getting really close to 50 people. So pretty cool. amazing turnout. They're still coming in, Rafi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. It's hard. Good to morning, Rafi. Good morning. Who's that? I can't see. If you talk, if you can say your name first, that'd be great just because, okay, awesome. Um, because uh, the way my setting is on my phone right now, I can't see the person talking necessarily because I'm trying to make sure I see what I have on camera as well. Now I will walk us in when we formally kick off and hand it to the camera that's on the tri tripod, but I wanted the mobility to start. So I want you guys to get a sense of walking into the building that we're gonna walk into. So we're not just randomly in the middle of the room. So it's almost like you're with me. And many of you all knew, know that I used to work at many different historic sites. The, the one I spent the most time at was the Gettysburg Battlefield. And I took tens of thousands of people on the battlefield over the years, if you add it up. Sometimes with a camera in my face, sometimes not. Sometimes it was one or two other visitors. Sometimes it was hundreds in the same group. Sometimes on the anniversary of the battle, sometimes just a regular old Tuesday. But um, I really value the experience of people, you know, as if you're here. And um, I also worked at Richmond, where the Confederate capital was. I worked at the Martin Luther King Martin Luther birth, King. Home, birth home in Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, very different as a National Park Service Park site. Service right, 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 right. And this reminds me of that a little bit, not in a major city like Atlanta, but we're all in town. And the Truman Home is a National Park Service site right in town. So it's not always... Yellowstone and you know Yosemite, and um, and then I worked at Los Alamos, where the historical society, there, which is not National Park Service, although there is now a National Park Service site there, and Los Alamos, of course, is where the atomic bomb was created, and of course the atomic that atomic bomb was later um, used against Japan to end World War II, and none other than our guy here. President Harry Truman was the man who ordered the atomic bomb. And therefore, that's the tie-in that we're going to see today. It ties into me personally because of the Los Alamos ties. It changed world history. It ties to really all of us personally in many ways because we live in a different world since that time because of the atomic bomb, because of nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, nuclear um, politics, Cold War, post-Cold War. We're dealing with it right now, right? With Russia, Ukraine, there's a nuclear consideration in all the relations and things that we do. So this stuff is around us today. You all know I'm all about connecting the past and present. And this is one of the places that helps shape world history. And as a little boy with Harry Truman, we didn't know that, but you don't know what's in, in, the front, in front of you in the future. Truman was very hardworking, studious, and I think that's one of the reasons that he rose to what he did. On one of the episodes for the kickoff of this show, because remember we're here to do this little, this live kickoff event for the nine episodes that are releasing for Cleo the Muse TV um, after, this show, after this program. And if you go to cleothemuse.tv, you will see them. C-L-I-O-T-H-E-M-U-S-E. Cleo the Muse, just like the ancient goddess for history, ancient Greek goddess for history. And on one of the episodes, we, we uh, talk about this and, um, because we have uh, General Paul Tibbetts in the Air Force. Now, I will introduce him more formally later for, because he's on this program as well to speak live. But on one of the episodes, we do a half hour interview with him. He is himself graduated first in his class at the Air Force Academy, General Paul Tibbetts on the call here today live. He's now retired, but he's also the grandson of the man who was General, who was Paul Tibbetts II, who flew the Enola Gay, which dropped the world's first atomic bomb and helped change world history. And he had direct interactions with Harry Truman. So that's our tie-in today. 
for what we're about to kick off here in just a moment and why I chose a Harry Truman house to do this live kickoff for the TV show series that's posting here. So I'm gonna get it started because we're about 10 minutes over and I, I know we still have people coming in, but we're gonna get it kicked off. So behind me is what he called the Summer White House. And we're gonna talk more about that in a, moment, in a little bit. But where we're gonna get started is across the street, right here at the Nolan home. And I'm gonna let our ranger inside talk more about it, but this was a home um, for, uh, that was by um, Truman's aunt and he had cousins here. And that's why he spent time here as a boy. And you'll see how these two buildings connect to each other as we walk in. Now, I thought this porch was beautiful. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to walk in together. Let's see here if I can get the camera to do what I want. They won't do exactly what I want, so we'll just make it work. So let's do this. Hello. Hi. All right, so we're gonna walk up. Oops. Here we go, I'm back. I froze for some reason. All right, so we're gonna walk up the porch of the Nolan home where we're gonna get started. And look at the, just the really cool details, right? On this porch and the, and the, around the trim. This is what you would see when you're coming in. And now we're gonna walk into the building. Check out the door. I just think it's so cool, the details on it. They're talking about restoring the door and how hard it is to find that cra those craftsmen today. That's their challenge right now. All right, so now we're gonna walk into the house here, the Nolan Hall. This is an awesome staircase. I'm gonna walk you into the parlor, which is how they would have received guests. And I'm gonna hand it off to our ranger here, let him introduce himself. He's been really great to us the last couple of days. Here, we're gonna watch this. Here. What? All right, we're back here. Yeah. We have Ranger Doug here. Doug, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about where we are. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be part of Leah's Muse. I think President Truman would get a lovely smile on his face at the name of the program series. My name is Doug Richardson. I'm a park ranger with the National Park Service at Harry S. Truman National Historic Site. I'm in my 28th year with the agency. In my first year with the National Park Service, I attended a training with many other park rangers. And as part of that training, we were asked if we could pick a park, that would be a dream assignment, which one would it be? So a lot of the rangers around me said they would love to work at Yellowstone or Yosemite. Some who were into the Civil War said Gettysburg or Vicksburg or Petersburg. What I did when I was asked the question, I said simply, Harry S. Truman National Historic Site in Independence, Missouri. And there were a couple of reasons for that. I was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania and grew up in that area. Both of my parents served in the United States Army under President Harry S. Truman as their commander in chief. And that meant a lot to them. How much did it mean? Well, I didn't know until I was sort of older that my parents had somewhat different political outlooks on life. And I learned later that frequently when they went to vote that they often canceled themselves out. So I learned late in life that my father was really one who tended towards the right side of the political spectrum, a conservative or Republican. But he told me that he voted for Harry Truman in 1948 and would have voted for Truman for every election since if he could. 
That's how much in high esteem my parents held Harry Truman. So that planted a seed in my mind that led me to doing some extensive work on Harry Truman in my undergraduate years in Pennsylvania. But then at the same time, in the early 1990s, there was a renaissance of sorts with Harry Truman and the Truman Scholarship, Truman Historiography. And one of the first examples of that was David McCullough's wonderful biography of Truman that came out 30 years ago this year. Unusual for a biography, it sold into the millions of copies, became a bestseller. And you started to see these books all over the place. And all of a sudden, here in 1992, people were talking about Harry Truman again. And they're, they're revisiting Truman, revisiting him as an individual, his presidency, his legacy. And then two other biographies quickly followed, one by Dr. Alonzo Hamby and by Dr. Robert Farrell. So by the middle of the 1990s, it was an exciting time to be in the world of Harry Truman. It took me a few years to make it to Independence, Missouri, and along the way, I've been fortunate to tell the story of the 1889 Johnstown, Pennsylvania flood that killed 2,209 people, the story of the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal and the Allegheny Portage Railroad, the Battle of Fort Necessity, the story of Friendship Hill and Albert Gallatin. It was also an honor and a privilege to be part of the early years of Flight 93 National Memorial. Also Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Historical Park, and Fort Donaldson National Battlefield. But I finally achieved my dream of reaching my dream park in 2017. It may sound silly, it may sound weird, and I'm not really going to apologize for it. Every day coming to work, I get the biggest thrill. Somebody who were to drink two gallons of Mountain Dew would not have the same charge that I feel being here every day. And I'm actually feeling that feeling right here in the Nolan Dome. This whole neighborhood, too, is also known as the Harry S. Truman Historic District, National Historic Landmark. Big long name. What does that mean? That means that this neighborhood around the Truman Home is a National Park Service recognized federally designated historic district. Now, what does that mean? That means that all of the neighbors here, the homeowners, the churches, the businesses, they take very great care in preserving the neighborhood in which Bess and Harry Truman lived and called home. So some things have changed since the president died in 1972. Some things have changed since Mrs. Truman died in 1982. Some infrastructure has changed. And as Harry Truman would say, that is how it should be. But thanks and credit to the neighbors and businesses and churches here, they have maintained this wonderful sense of community that I really believe that if somehow President and Mrs. Truman had the ability to be with us today instead of me here in the Nolan home, they would be able to look at everything and recognize almost everything as it was. And so much credit to our neighbors here. The neighbors have also maintained a sense of community. And I think Harry Truman would recognize that too. Truman called Independence Missouri the center of the world. And he did that shortly after coming home in 1953. There was really no question after living in the White House, they were going to come home to independence. It is home. And I know that each of you that I'm talking to here on camera, that all of you have a home too. The word home has a wonderful meaning to us. It's a place where we feel comfortable. We feel at home. It's no coincidence that that word is used. Truman was not born in Independence, Missouri. However, on May 8th of 1884, Harry Truman was born in a wonderful little house in Lamar, Missouri. That home today is preserved by a wonderful state park, Harry S. Truman Birthplace State Park. Missouri is called the Show Me State, and we would like to show you 
So I hope we can show you some things today. And I hope that you can come in person and see these wonderful places that we're going to talk about. When Harry Truman was a few years old, they moved a little further north and they lived briefly on Mrs. Tr uh, Mr. Truman's mother's family farm near Grandview, Missouri. And so some of Truman's earliest memories are of that farm near Grandview. When Harry Truman was about six years old, in 1890, John Anderson and Martha Truman moved them and their three children, Harry, John Vivian, and uh, the, the sister Mary Jane, and they moved here to Independence mostly because Mama Truman, as they called her, wanted the children to go to the best schools in the area. And those best schools were here in Independence. And so, Many of Truman's formative years were here in what he later called the center of the world. He had nothing but good memories about all of his teachers. He recalled later on in life that by the time he graduated from high school in 1901, that he had read every book in the Independence Public Library. There were also other milestones for him here in Independence. Shortly after they moved to town, even though the Trumans were Baptists, the children attended a Presbyterian Sunday school just around the block from where I am right now. So when Harry Truman was six years old, he was receiving that religious education, but what caught his mind and his heart was a beautiful little five-year-old girl with blonde hair with curls, and blue eyes. Her name was Bess or Bessie Wallace. How old was Truman at that time? Truman was six years old. So, so young puppy love. So gentlemen <laughs> out there, if you were ever in love at six years old and maintained that love for 82 years, you are not alone with that. There was never, it seems, another girl or woman ever for Harry Truman. Now, Bess or Bessie Wallace, didn't necessarily reciprocate that, but generally they ended up going to school together. They lived relatively close in the neighborhood and they graduated in 1901. We'd like to show you that graduation photograph. It's one of my absolute favorite photographs. And I don't mind telling you that I spend a few minutes every day looking at this photograph of the 1901 Independence High School graduating class. Now, if you notice in the photograph on the glass up above it is a Latin phrase that was the motto of the school, Juventus Spis Mundi. Truman loved that phrase and he used it for the rest of his life talking to kids. That is Latin for youth, the hope of the world. Now, a lot of the people in that photograph went on to some very important things, but if you notice on the top left photograph of the photograph, you'll see a gentleman in circle there. That is Harry S. True, part of the graduating class of 1901. The and very back row. Very back row. And on the right, far right of the photograph circle, you will see Miss Bess Wallace. The sassy one. And she has just the most bewitching grin on her face. I'd also like you to, to notice on the far left of the photograph, another gentleman who is circled. That is a man by the name of Charles G. Ross, who was the class valedictorian in the Independence High School class of 1901 and one of Harry Truman's best friends. Shortly after Harry Truman became president of the United States on the 12th of 1945, in order to have some advisors that he knew that he could trust, which was important for a president of the United States, Harry Truman called upon his friend, Charlie Ross, to come and serve him as press secretary. And Charlie Ross served in that position for over five years. So for example, this week, you may have noticed that Chen Saki in the White House stepped down as White House press secretary. Charlie Ross was one of her first predecessors. So in that photograph, you see a future president of the United States, his future first lady, 
and a future press secretary for the 33rd president of the United States. Now, Doug, tell us real quick um, for, for Ross, before he was press secretary, he was pretty accomplished himself, right? He was. Uh, Charlie Jones. Ross was a well-regarded writer and journalist, and at the time that he became press secretary for President Truman, he had already received the Pulitzer Prize for some of his writings and was writing for a very prominent St. Louis newspaper. He actually gave up a lot of salary to take that job, but he believed in Harry Truman, he believed in America, and put the country first. And so what I really find fascinating here, guys, is here is a photo, nobody knows what's to come, and you know, look at what's in front of them. Look at the possibility in front of them that comes from, out from right here near where we are. Now, of course, we're in the parlor here, right, Doug? And we have a really cool video of the original uh, uh, room, if you will. Mm -hmm. Tell us just a little bit about that period when of the video, because I'm gonna pull it up. Let me play it really quick, it's 30 seconds. This is a wonderful film clip that was recently digitized by the wonderfully talented people and our best friends at the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. And this film was shot in the early 1960s as part of a television show. I don't know if the volume is coming through. Sorry, guys, I don't know if the volume is coming through, but. I want you to see the room. That's the main purpose of this, more so than what she's saying. And look at the room set up. Look at the view out the window. It's the same house across the street, the Truman home that you saw um, outside. I'm going to go in front in of in picture. just a moment. But I want you to see, just I'll play one more time so you see that. And just really cool. And this is the room that Truman would have crashed in. Correct. That came into. So, in picture. Uh, Rafi. Rafi. Robert, yeah, there's no picture that we can see, so it's oh, just really? a blank screen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's see if I can fix that. Go ahead and tell us the story. Right. Sure, absolutely. About five years after Harry Truman graduated from college, he and his mother and father and siblings returned to the family farm near Grandview, Missouri, and from 1906 until 1917. Harry Truman worked on that family farm and did everything that a farmer would be expected to do in that great agrarian age. But when he and his family would visit Independence from Grandview, which today is about a 20 minute drive, but back then of course was more of an ordeal, they would stay here at this home. This home belonged to Harry Truman's Uncle Joseph and Ella and some of his favorite cousins, the Nolan family. And one of those wonderful feelings that I love is here in the parlor. This is where Harry Truman would stay when he visited Independence. And looking out this window, the very same window that Truman would have, say, in 1906, he would see what was then called the Gates Wallace home at 219 North Delaware. It was one of the most prominent homes in town, but Harry Truman certainly knew that, but that's not why he was in awe of 219 North Delaware. He was in awe of 219 North Delaware because living in that home was that beautiful, blonde, curly-haired young lady with the blue eyes that he fell in love with in 1890. They probably had not seen each other since graduation in 1901. But one day, we think in 1910, Truman was visiting the family here at the Nolan's home, and he said something like, I would love to see this Wallace again. Well, the Nolan family happened to have some type of a paper insert plate, and the custom was you borrowed a plate, you would return it. So the Nolan family engineered a reunion of sorts. They handed the cake plate, the dessert plate to Harry Truman and said, maybe you could return it across the street. Well, according to the family tradition, Truman ran across the street at the speed of light, rang the bell, Bess Wallace answered, said hello. Maybe the first time that Harry Truman and Bess Wallace had seen one another since graduation, she said, come in, and the rest is history. The courtship was on, starting what we believe here is perhaps the greatest presidential romance of all time. Uh, Doug. 
So, uh, Doug, we have the photo up now. I just took a photo of it to put it up. This video is giving me trouble. But what you all see there is the original living room setup. You see the house out the window that we just saw from our view. And we're going to go there next. And, and, and I'm going to set up there in just a moment. So next time you see me, we'll be there. But in the meanwhile, so in the meanwhile, um, well, I'm going to hand it off to General Paul Tibbetts who is on the call and and remember to refresh because I know people were joining in throughout because I know a lot of people were trying to join at once. Uh, General Paul Tibbetts IV, he himself is a retired Air Force General, graduated number one in his class at the Air Force Academy, himself an accomplished uh, military man, really fun guy, have had dinner, drinks with, with the man, wonderful person. And he is the grandson of Paul Tibbetts II, who flew the Enola Gay to drop the world's first atomic bomb. Of course, those orders were given by President Truman. And he is one of the featured guests when you pull up the episodes later on. But I wanted to jump on and tell us the story real quick while we're here at the Truman House um, about his grandfather and Truman. So Paul, I'll hand it to you as I go over to the next site. Oh, hi, good morning. Can everybody uh, hear me okay? Yes, I hear you. Okay. I still see the photo, Rafi. Uh, I'm about to turn it off. <laughs> yep. So now we're going to leave. I'm going to turn my camera off so you can talk, and I'll right. be setting up at the other place by the time you're done. All right? So go ahead and go ahead and tell us the story, Paul. And I'll, I'll do my part. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, one let you know that I have this show out today because we're actually on vacation the next day with my son who just graduated from uh, college. So uh, I'm going to uh, in the background, you see a photograph of the Nola Gay. Here's some other background noise. Oh, there we go. Uh, in the background, you can see a photograph of, uh, or I'll say a picture of a, of a painting that was done. That's the Nola Gay in the background with the B2 in the foreground. Uh, my grandfather had this commission back when I was a captain at the 519th Bomb Wing flying the uh, B-2 bomber, and uh, he called it the legacy. And the reason he did, I think is probably relatively clear now, but the Enola Gay was the beginnings of the 509th, uh, which at the time was called the composite group, and now the 519th Bomb Wing flying the B-2. So he commissioned this painting, which uh, was very touching to me because I didn't know anything about it until he surprised me with it. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we spent over 10 years at Whiteman Air Force Base. Uh, my grandfather was there many times. We visited the, many of the Truman House, the Truman Estate, uh, the library uh, together, and it was quite a treat to be able to talk with him while we visited these historic sites. So, Rafi, it's uh, very appropriate, I think, uh, for you to kick off today this session uh, for Cleo the Muse and talk a little bit about the legacy with my grandfather and Truman. Yes. And uh, so the story that Rafi wants me to share with you, and then I'll get off the stage, is uh, about his interaction with the president after the war. Uh, so a few years uh, after the war ended, uh, pr my, President Truman called my grandfather to the White House. At the time, my, my grandfather was living in the D.C. area, and uh, he was not certain. It wasn't like today where everything is sort of telegraphed and choreographed, you know, when you go see the president, everybody knows what's going on or anybody like that. It wasn't anything, it wasn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, as my grandfather tells the story, he had no idea why he was being called to the White House, uh, which to me is very interesting. Uh, but when he went there, he found out that there was some very high ranking gentlemen also at the White House to meet with President Truman. And my grandfather, in his words, was uh, a little taken aback because he he thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a lowly, as he was, he was a colonel. He said, I'm a colonel and we have these High-ranking generals, one of them you might recognize was uh, General Jimmy Doolittle, who led the Doolittle Raiders. Um, so they were there to meet with the president, and my grandfather, this colonel, was also there, and he wasn't sure what this was about, and actually didn't know exactly what he was supposed to be prepared for. However, they proceeded with the uh, uh, walking into the Oval Office, and inside the Oval Office, if you can just picture this with me, was the desk. And then in front of the desk, there were three chairs. This is where these other gentlemen sat. And they went in first. And there was no chair for my grandfather. And 
So he just stood there and waited and he said it was a little bit uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden he was escorted and set down on the side of the president's desk, which my grandfather then really thought, okay, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I've done, but here I am going to sit, you know, on the right, you know, right next to the president uh, as this, of course, younger officer in the uh, Army Air Corps. Well, this time it had just become the Air Force. And that was one of the celebrations the president wanted to acknowledge. So as this was taking place, the gentleman sat down in front of the desk. My grandfather was placed next to the desk. The president came in, and so it began. And um, everybody sat down, and for about, my grandfather says, 20 or 30 minutes, the president addressed the folks in front, thanking them. It, we, he talked to Jimmy Doolittle. We talked about the beginnings of the Air Force, some of, the, some of these very important things that happened and from, from World War II time. And so, you know, these conversations was mostly the president talking and everyone else listening, him thanking them and celebrating the, the, the victory and celebrating these times that we're in right now, which my grandfather said was very interesting, but he still wasn't sure why he's sitting there on the side of the, the president's desk. But he just, you know, he sat there and listened and it was, it was enjoyable to listen to the president be so grateful uh, to these men and to these times. Uh, but after about 30 minutes or so, as this, this conversation went on, um, we, we, he stopped and my, my grandfather thought, well, I guess, I guess it's over. I'm still not sure why I'm here, but he finished, finished talking. And then he turns over to my grandfather and he looks at him and he says, it, it just it, it, as almost emphatically, but as calmly as he, you, you would think, he says, so Paul, uh, what do you think? And my grandfather's very quick with it. He's very, you know, very smart, very quick on his feet. Um, again, he wasn't sure why he was there exactly. I mean, he figured it had something to do maybe with the mission, but he wasn't sure. But the question was, so Paul, what do you think? And my grandfather, you know, quickly thinking, okay, I, I, I'm assuming, you know, what he's talking about. He said, well, Mr. President, I think I did what I was supposed to do. And the president, he said, the president looked at him, he slammed his fist down on the desk. And he said, you're right, Paul. And I'm the one who sent you. If anybody gives you a hard time about it, you have them come to me. And I thought about that over the years, you know, and, and that was the entire conversation, by the way, and then they left. And uh, I've talked to many friends about this. I've talked to my grandfather about it. And I think we can all appreciate that I, the president was basically looking at my grandfather and saying, you know, what you did was really important. You did a great job. You did exactly what I asked you to do as the president of the United States. You followed orders. You executed those orders nearly flawlessly, and, and you helped bring this awful war to an end, saving countless lives and bringing generations or keeping generations of people alive that might have not otherwise been alive had we continued to fight this war. That's pretty significant. And the President of the United States thought it was important enough to bring my grandfather to the White House to share that literally like one sentence or two sentences with him. But I, but I think, Rafi, if you'll allow me just one more second, I think th there's one more piece that's probably more important than even that. And that was, hey, Paul, you were the military man that executed the military orders from the president of the United States. Things are going to happen throughout your life where, you know, people may feel differently about these actions. You know, you never know what's going to happen in the future. But I think what the president was trying to say is, you know, you, you may have people that, that not blame is not the right term, but, but maybe look at you and say, well, you did this, but in a negative way. A lot of people are going to say you did this in a positive way, and thank you. But whatever happens, remember that you just did your job and I'm the one, the president, I'm the one that ordered you. I'm the one that said, we need to do this. This is important for our country, uh, for those fighting and, and for the world. So, uh, I mean, you just think about that for a second while this man, I mean, we all know Truman was just absolutely brilliant, but to think that that was important enough for him to bring this, you know, Colonel that did something really important to the White House to have that conversation is, is, is really impressive. Uh, it's really impressive. And my grandfather, every time he spoke, he would tell that story. And I just think it's so meaningful and it gives you a sense of the man behind you know, the, 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 the presidency. And also my grandfather who lived, by the way, 
until he was not, almost 93 years old. And he did have a lot of opportunities for folks to uh, see the positive in what happened during that time, but, but then also to share their own opinions about maybe what they thought differently. And that's fine. You know, that's what this great country is all about. And my grandfather hand, handled it magnificently, as you can imagine. Uh, but but that's that that's the story, and that was the time. And I'm just so grateful. Thank you, Paul. For so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you know, you want to catch more of that story and a lot more with General Paul Tibbetts here. Um, he is on the uh, one of the episodes that we feature. Of course, we have nine episodes. Um, it's a great story of how family history can tie together. You know, uh, it's family history, it's national history, it's global history. And these are real people that you're talking about in history. They're not just frozen photos. They're not just names in the textbook. These are real people, just like you and me. And if you go to cleothemuse.tv, C-L-I-O-T-H-E-M-U-S-E, cleothemuse.tv, you will see those shows, those episodes posting here soon. But I want to show you this real quick. Behind me is a house we were just at, at the Nolan House, and we are now on the property of the Truman Home, his summer White House, as it was known. And I'm going to walk you up just like I did before, so you get kind of the experience. Now here, we're going to have Doug tell us a little bit about what's inside. And then we're going to have one of our other guests jump on and talk in a moment. But again, you see a really decorated porch, the view from the porch. And Doug, I'm going to hand it to you. All right, Doug, go ahead. It is my distinct honor to welcome you, at least virtually, to 219 North Delaware Street. From 1945 to 1953, 219 North Delaware Street in Independence, Missouri, was perhaps the second most famous address in America, with the first being 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They were both white, and they were both lived in by a president of the United States. But the first time that Harry S. Truman stepped into 219 North Delaware Street, all of that was very much in the distant future. Someday, we think in 1910, Harry Truman went to the front door of this lovely home. To return that cake plate, Miss Wallace answered the door and the courtship started. From 1910 to 1919, what Harry Truman did, aside from working on the family farm and serving in the Great War in France, Harry Truman's most powerful campaign, it could be argued, was winning the heart of Bess Wallace and gaining the approval of the family. When Truman first visited this home, most around here knew it as the Gates Mansion. The home itself was built by Bess Wallace Truman's grandfather, a gentleman by the name of George Porterfield Gates, who was a partner in a very big flower mill. If you're from the Midwest, you might have heard the phrase or the name Queen of the Pantry Flower up until the mid 20th century. That flower mill is what gave the generational wealth to George Gates and his lovely wife, Elizabeth, that built 219 North Delaware Street. And just to be clear for a moment, I showed you the house earlier. We are now on the porch of the house he's speaking of. So you, it's like we're sitting on the porch. Right. And, and um, so Doug, I know we can't go inside. Um, you need to visit here to go inside, but give us a sense of what's inside the Summer White House. Sure. The house was built in two parts from 1867 and then 1885. Inside, you will see evidence of that. When visitors come in and do a tour of the Truman home, the first room that they experience is the kitchen, which as many visitors say, doesn't necessarily look like a president's kitchen would look. Many visitors say, this is how my kitchen looked growing up. Many visitors will say, you know, we have that table. We have that blender. We have that toaster. So the kitchen is a wonderful place for visitors to make connections with those things. In the dining room, it's in a newer part of the home from 1885, it's a little more formal. So you would see the dining room 
as Margaret Truman Daniel, Harry and Bess Truman's daughter remembered it. We have to remember that from 1945 to 1953, while this was known as the Summer White House, Harry Truman didn't own it. It belonged to his mother-in-law, the lovely Madge Gates Wallace. So he was in essence a renter or an occupant of the home. But in the dining room, when Mother Wallace owned the home, it was always formal. So that Victorian tradition continued. Harry and Bess Truman formally bought the home in 1953 after Mrs. Truman's mother died. And starting in 1953, now that the Trumans own the home, they made some minor but significant improvements to make it home. They shored up the structure a little bit, put new carpeting down, put some new wallpapering in, and, and made it their own. And Doug, tell me this. I know it's their home, right? And yet they, they received very many notables here, and they have gifts in there that people brought, right? Kind of like, you know, I think of when you go to the White House, and you go to, you know, you go in, there's all kinds of gifts from foreign heads of state and other folks that have been there. And it's because, of, because this was a summer White House, you know, Truman received um, guests here and there's actual stuff they can see from around the world in there, right? Can you tell Correct. us about that a little yeah, bit? And Truman probably never had any idea that when he returned that cake plate that this house would be a source of power, it would be a power base. Not necessarily in the way that we envision power because the presidency has changed a bit in the age of television, but this was the seat of power. Now, the Gates Mansion was a large, beautiful home. There were many large, beautiful homes here on Delaware Street. There still are in this wonderful neighborhood. It just happens that, especially in the president's retirement period, presidents of the United States, some of his former cabinet officers, uh, the leader of South Korea came to visit here. And so it's humbling to think of all of those dignitaries and friends who dropped in at 219 North Delaware Street, even celebrities of the like of Henry Fonda and Jack Benny visited 219 North Delaware Street. The Trumans would have liked to have considered themselves just another set of neighbors here in this neighborhood. It just happened that these neighbors Happened and, to receive visits by presidents of the United States. And one of the neighbors was the Secret Service, right? That's exactly. And right. That, that's why I oriented the camera this way. If you look at that brick building on the right side of your screen, that's where the Secret Service hung out. That's one of the places the Secret Service hung out. Tell us a little bit about the Secret Service here in that fence. Absolutely. The property here around 219 North Delaware Street, which remember was Harry Truman's mother in law's house. There were some security challenges here. It sits on what is today a major thoroughfare called Truman Road, then it was known as Van Horn Road, a major thoroughfare into Kansas City. When Truman became vice president and then president, this became a place where sightseers came to see. We want to see where this man from Missouri is. A lot of people didn't really know who Harry Truman was on April 12, 1945, when he took that oath of office. So there were some security challenges here. One of the first things that the United States Secret Service did was they brought down some electronic eye gizmos from Franklin Roosevelt's estate in New York. And the object of these electric eyes were to cast beams around the property to catch anything that broke the beams. Now that did help in the case of people not coming onto the property, but it wasn't all that great. In 1949, partly at the suggestion of President Herbert Hoover, the United States Secret Service built this black iron fence that surrounds the property today. And as we like to remind visitors, perhaps it was a little bit of a simpler time, but this is high tech, 1949, the United States Secret Service protection. Now, in 1953, when Harry Truman left office, the law at the time did not provide a pension for former presidents. So Harry Truman dropped down from a $100,000 a year job out of which he had to pay all expenses down to a little over $112 a month in an army pension. Nor did he receive secret service protection after leaving office. The city of Independence loaned out a really wonderful guy by the name of Paul Mike Westwood who served as Truman's bodyguard and driver. 
Unfortunately, it took the events of Dallas in November of 1963 to inspire some rethinking of what the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Assassination That's what he's of John F. Kennedy. Yeah. After that, Congress authorized and President Johnson authorized the Secret Service to protect former presidents. Mr. and Mrs. Truman were not fans of that. They were not really interested in having the Secret Service back. But even then, as now, sometimes there were problems and threats against the president. So eventually, for the last few years of Harry Truman's life, the United States Secret Service went to that little bungalow on the corner. And from there, they had mechanisms to protect the home and the family. And the Secret Service agents were here until the day of Mr. Truman's death in October of 1982. So, Doug, um, what we're going to do now is let's pause for this for this segment. And, guys, I'm going to put on one of our other guests next. And then after that, you're going to see the reel for the season, and we'll wrap up. So, Damari uh, Swanigan, I know Damari's on here somewhere, is going to be one of our uh, is going to be our next speaker online. And he is one of our guests. I'll let him say a little bit about our relationship and how he and I interact. And you'll understand why he's on the show, because if you know me, and obviously you know me if you're on here, um, you know how I am. And um, I have my quirks and Damari captures it very well. And it gets captured in the show that you can check out at cleothemuse.tv. So Damari, come on on as we go on to our next, uh, as we pause here. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Rafi? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, so this has been uh, really, really informative. I was just thinking about uh, Paul speaking and uh, talking about his uh, grandfather's experience with uh, the, the president and just made me realize like how succinct and laconic the president is and how Rafi is the exact opposite. And Rafi loves to hear himself talk. And I just want to share a couple of stories um, just to make fun of Rafi. But uh, my very first time meeting Rafi was at an event for uh, advisors. And uh, there was an event for top advisors. They sent us down to Dallas and I believe Rafi won some award of some sort. And uh, Rafi, he gets up there, he gives this really great speech. He's in tears. Uh, everyone is applauding. And I remember just sitting there, you know, with almost like disdain. I'm just like, oh God, this dude is so annoying. Who is this person? Why is he up there? He's been rambling. He was only supposed to talk for a few minutes. He's just talking and talking. And then, you know, once he finally wraps up, everyone is just like applauding him and you know, they're walking up to him, basically just like asking for autographs and photos and all of these things. And I was just very unimpressed. And um, okay, thank you. He didn't like my charisma. <laughs> I just I was just unimpressed. I was like, gosh, when will this guy stop talking? And so um, he finally stops talking. Everyone is, you know, giving him the accolades and all of that stuff. I just made a beeline for the restroom or whatever. And uh, we didn't really we didn't really talk that much, but we saw each other later in just like uh, some of the uh, I think in the dining area or something like that. And I would notice that he he just kept looking at me, and I look back at him. I'm like, what, what's up with this guy? What's, why is this guy looking at me? Right? And we didn't we didn't talk honestly until maybe I, I want to say like a year later or something. We were back in Dallas or in Houston or something for for another event for for some advisors. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure we met before. And I'm like, no, no, we, we've never met. We've never met. I, I, I saw you we were at that one event together. But, you know, I, I intentionally didn't talk to you. And he was like, yeah, I kind of felt like that. So if you want to gain Rafi's respect, just ignore him. That's the best way to do it. And he'll come after you. So that's something that I, I, I learned about Rafi. But uh, I've been friends with Rafi for about, I don't know, five or six years at this point now. And one of my favorite things about Rafi is we got to know each other is Rafi loves to talk, but it's very insightful, right? And he, we, uh, you know, he's like my verbal jousting partner, right? So every time we get together, 
we just love to, well, he loves to argue about any and every topic. And, you know, I'm smart enough to know, like, if there's a topic that I don't, you know, I'm not uh, well versed in, I won't argue about it, but he wants to argue anyway. So really, really great story. The last time um, I saw Rafi, well, actually the time before last, we were, <laughs> we were in Dallas with a group of uh, advisors having a, a study group session for the weekend and uh, everyone's hungry so, <laughs> so we leave and we're in the car and we, we go to uh whataburger so if you if you're in texas or you've ever been to texas i mean it's like it's like a religion whataburger you know football and, and faith i think those are the one family right and then there's whataburger and so the 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 big point is what are the what's the best between the three and the three are whataburger in and out burger and Shake Shack. So if you're, you know, from the East Coast, a lot of those people think Shake Shack is the best. You know, if you're uh, from the West Coast, you think In and Out is the best. And of course, in Texas, they they say Whataburger is the best. Uh, Fanny says they have the best hamburgers in the world, right? So um, I would have to disagree. I'm not really a burger person, and I'm definitely from the Midwest. I'm from Chicago, but I. You know, I think In-N-Out burgers are the best. So there's a group of people. Everyone is saying what they think is the best. Of course, this is all subjective. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I think In-N-Out is the best. And everyone's going around saying what they think is the best. And fine. And I say uh, In-N-Out. And Rafi's like, yeah, In-N-Out is the best. But why? <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, I don't know preference, man. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's subjective. He's like, no, because you have to look at, you have to look at, you know, where the beef comes from, where the beef comes from and the manufacturing and yada, yada, yada. He's going on this whole like rigmarole below. Exactly. Right. Bruce gets it. So I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well that's subjective because even if you use whatever set of criteria you want to de to decide which is you know the best or which is better uh it's still it's still limited because you're choosing the criteria to decide what's better it's just a subjective thing you know better is 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 obviously uh it's obviously subjective and he goes on and on and on and on about why it's better and why my my uh thought pattern of why you can't say something that's better. The more I was... want to jump in there for a moment. Okay. The funny thing about this is that we both agreed on which burger is better, and yet we still had a debate. And that's yeah. me right there, because I, I don't just let you say what you think and you believe. you got to justify why. And, and, and that's what you, as you said, I was asking why. I was explaining why. And even when I agree, I will argue and we'll do devil's advocate, and I will make you justify your position, because it's not about finding agreement. It's about having a deeper understanding, even if it's trivial, like a burger. But the point is that that's the mindset and personality that I bring to the show. That's the purpose of the show, is I interview different people with different perspectives and backgrounds in ways that they engage with history. And um, some are historians, some are not. Some apply it in everyday life, some apply it in their profession, some it informs their perspective on how they do parenting even. And that, and, and what, what I believe in is inquiry. The tagline of the show is cha um, challenging the present by inquiring the past. Inquiring is right there in the tagline. And, and I believe that what, what I'm trying to do with this show and this larger venture in history is use history as a lens to make us think deeper, reflect, and have more nuanced perspectives and understand why we believe what we do of what's around us and understand that we don't have to hate the people that we disagree with but we do have to dig in a little deeper and reflect and understand that there are gray ways to see things. I see the world in gray, even when I'm getting into a debate. So uh, Damari, thanks man for the story, for the insight. I'm gonna yeah. jump to Zondra right now because I want Zondra to kind of uh, finish this off with, um, of course, Zondra Evans is the owner of the uh, network Zondra TV. And that's the network that we're on. When you go to cleothemuse.tv, you'll see that we're on Zondra TV, which is hosted by Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. And um, I want her just to say a little bit about the season. She's going to play a reel, a highlight reel of the season, and we're going to wrap up 
um, just be available for Q&A after that. So Zandra, I'll hand it to you. All right, Robbie. <laughs> First of all, congratulations on this hybrid reveal. I was so excited about it. I was like, oh God, we're gonna get to see all of this. It's been um, simply amazing. It's been amazing. So um, I'm actually in the studio today and we are recording today. So I gotta keep my voice a little low. Um, thank you, Rafi. You're an amazing uh, individual. You're an amazing producer. I couldn't be happier. And yes, we are streaming on multiple Roku, Apple, Amazon, Fire uh, streaming networks. And we just sealed a deal uh, also with an Australian TV network that we're excited about. And so that's going to give us a greater international presence. Uh, we already have an international presence, but it'll be greater from there. Many of you on here have businesses. And so I encourage you and, and, and really employ you to, to work with Rafi by getting a commercial on his show. Y'all should have a commercial on his show, uh, or maybe you even want to be featured on his show. So I thank you all for coming. You've got a big crowd here. I'm going to share my screen and give you all a little bit uh, of a, a taste of the shows that Rafi has done for his season two of Cleo the Muse. Hold on. Right, here we go, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to Cleo the Muse TV, where we surprise, provoke, and inspire so you can challenge the present by inquiring the past. Today we have Brigadier General Paul Tibbetts IV visiting us, coming in from Louisiana. Uh, growing up, uh, my grandfather uh, was the pilot of the Enola Gay, which dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, household name for his generation, from World War II, the greatest generation, and of course my father's generation, household name. Uh, something I didn't quite realize when I was a little guy, a little tot growing up, but I had to figure that out, right? What, what is that going to mean for me? Uh, the, but the one name that most people tend to remember is Susan B. Anthony. Right. She's on the dollar coin. Right. Uh, but she actually did not live to see women's suffrage um, in her lifetime. Uh, so the, the newspaper clipping here is from 1906, News of Her Passing. Um, and actually, if you open up a little hi uh, history from when it actually um, was written, you can see that only four states had granted uh, full suffrage to women by the time she passed away in wow. 1906. Um, so of course she was one of many, many uh, great women who, who led this movement, uh, but she was not you know, able to see it through in her lifetime. Right, because at that time the Soviet Union wanted um, uh, they wanted South Africa because of all, all the, the uranium. So they were ready in Angola and different other places and Mozambique. So we were fighting our, our borders and protecting them all the time from the Soviet Union. I wasn't accepted in the black community at first. It was just, I looked at it as having more privilege. I looked a different way. So they already knew that I was going to get taught a different, I mean, treated a different way in public. It was just a common knowledge that, you know, if I walk into somewhere with somebody a darker, then I was going to be treated differently. I was going to get the job that they didn't. So there was immediately, I would have to earn respect. I would have to, you know, just earn that respect of that audience that, you know, I'm not using that privilege. You know, we're, we're all the same. I don't feel like I'm better than you. And you can find me at cleothemuse.club for live interaction the way we're doing here. For today, we're wrapping up at Cleo the Muse TV. And please remember to challenge the present by inquiring the past. Right. 
All awesome. Right. Thank you, Sandra. Amazing. Go ahead. Do you have Amazing. any final, final comments? And we're going to open it. No final Q&A. comments. Uh, awesome job. Proud of you. Uh, and uh, you all go out and watch ZondraTV.com. Y'all go look at those shows today. Yes, there's all kinds of other shows on there as well. And Zandra, honestly, one of the most positive, inspiring people you will ever meet in your life. And that's why I chose to work with her on this and uh, if y'all want to ever want to get introduced to her, I'm happy to connect you to her. She's absolutely amazing. And not just a great producer, but a great person and all kinds of things. So um, thank you, Zandra. We're going to wrap it up here. We have Ranger Doug here. I'm going to get back on camera there. We're going to open it to q and I'll hang out here as long as you all want to with the Q&A. But otherwise, we're going to wrap up the formal part of our program with the different speakers and segments. I thank you all so much. I'm gonna get back on here. Here I am. <laughs> and um, if y'all have any questions, hang around. We got our camera lady over there who's what paying attention. Now, please, at this point, um, I think the questions would be a little easier if you put yourself on unmute and say them so we can hear them because I can't see the chat from here. No one's questioning. No questions. That's okay. Just tell me when we have um, people. No more there. No one's there anymore. For those there, please come to Independence, Missouri. Come and see us. We call this the Truman Home, but thanks to Best Wallace Truman, it's your home now. So please come and see us. Yeah, so you got to visit. You got to visit here. I, I really love it. Of course, check out the show at cleothemuse.tv, C-L-I-O-T-H-E-M-U-S-E.tv. Those episodes are available now. And if you go to cleothemuse.club, so the same words, but .club at the end, you'll see my club that is a subscription. Now, the TV is free, but if you join the club, there is a subscription. And there I do a lot of live events on site um, as well. So you can check out both those sites. Please go watch the show with our different guests. It looks like we have a question. Someone put in the chat. Igor wants to know what's your favorite burger. In and out, yeah. from the from the fast food joints. Yeah, I mean, otherwise it's the burger I made, but separate of what I made. <laughs> hey, Rafi, I got a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just curious, what is, who, who is that maybe? I can't see? Oh, sorry, it's Brandon. Uh, Brandon okay, cool. Rizzo. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, I'm actually Damari's partner on our, uh, no, no. our show. Yep, We're yep. going to have you on. Yeah. Um, so just curious, uh, what, you know, do you have a favorite topic from history that you like to talk about? Like in your oh you know, gosh, personal time like, or somebody pick my favorite child, which I don't have children, but, um, if you put me to it, you're not, you're not going to believe this because you, you're probably, you, I don't always show this, but, um, I would say, 18th century um, colonial era, in the early mid 18th century. I just, and, 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 and I would call it Atlantic history. It's a history kind of across the Atlantic Ocean. We really have to understand Europe, Africa, and the Americas together. But we consider colonial America here prior to the United States forming and into the revolution. Um, one of my books is on debates around the Constitution. Um, which is a little later, that's post-colonial, but it's, that's kind of on the tail end of it, of the era I really love most. And the reason for that, before you ask me why, is because it is a very complicated world at that time. Um, there is multiple empires, multiple um, polities, multiple um, groups of people from various local indigenous tribes to various European empires that are competing on the North, Central, and South American continent. And I find that fascinating. And I learn a lot from that. A lot of communication breakdown sometimes. A lot of uh, great things, bad things. Um, and it's a different enough world that it makes you question assumptions around you today that you take for granted and think this is how things always were or are. But when you look back then and you see something is a fundamental different kind of belief, it makes you go, huh, it wasn't always that way. And that makes me inquire the whole inquiry thing and to why did it change and how? And at least not take what I see around me as an absolute truth, as, um, as a universal truth, which then means that these things can be discussed and I'm all about dialogue and different ways of understanding. So um, that's why, 
That's why. And I find the colonial era the most fascinating. Rafi, okay. you, have, you have another question. Oh, is, do ahead. you have somebody doing that for you? Uh, Fanny has her hand raised. Fanny, do you want to unmute and say what you want to say? Yes. First, first, I want to say thank you for this reveal. I definitely enjoyed it. My question is for a Ranger Doug. Uh, yes. I found um, it is so interesting. Thank you for sharing the history of Ranger Doug. But did My you honor. say your, your mom and dad was in the military or did I get that wrong? That is correct. That is correct. They didn't know each other at the time, but my father was trained as a sharpshooter. Uh, now, fortunately, he told me he never had to perform that service, but he was in the service. My mother, who I just lost a few weeks ago, my mother actually enlisted formally in the United States Army about three days before Harry Truman received the phone call of North Korea invading South Korea. And he received that phone call right here at 219 North Delaware Street. So almost immediately, my mother was into wartime. And she originally wanted to get into the nursing corps, but she ended up being a cryptographer, which is something I did not know until I was out of college. She never really talked about it a whole lot. But the more I learned, the more I realized that both of my parents had extraordinary service in the United States Army and were very proud of their commander in chief. Mm, so they left a lot of history with you, your mother. That's interesting. Did she leave a lot of history of, of her experiences in the in the military? I'll tell you, not until relatively recently. She came to visit me here in Independence one time and really the floodgates, and this is a wonderful thing for me, the, it's a wonderful memory for me, the floodgates opened when I took her through the president's home and she recognized the significance of it all. And then we went, we went down to the Truman Library. We were able to, on the research side, show her some documents from the Korean War. And that's when really a lot of the floodgates of memory started coming out. And so that was really a, a blessing. Now, when they both were discharged from the Army, they eventually worked together at the same A&P grocery store in Preston, Pennsylvania, wow. and, and that's where they met. But both of my parents were really reluctant to talk about details of their service mm -hmm. until I was older. Now, I don't know why that is or was, but I think as I got older and, and yeah. I got into this field of history and became a historian, they seem to open up a little bit more. So I'm glad to have that memory. Okay, thank you for sharing, Ranger. You're so welcome, okay. thank you. Kurt has a question and I'm not sure which one this is directed to, but who is your favorite role model and why? Oh, I like you first. Well, I will answer that and I will say this man here, uh, you're probably not surprised at that, but I'll tell you why. There are some people who assume that those of us who are into Truman or Lincoln or George Washington or any of, any of, any of these people that we idolize them for being perfect when that's really not the case. One of the reasons that I admire Harry Truman as much as I do is because he was a human being who made mistakes, admitted to making mistakes. Truman admitted as president that he he was probably the least educated person in the room, and that's how he wanted it. He wanted the best advisors around him. And because of the people who lived here in this house with him, whether he was a county executive or a United States senator, president of the United States, former president, he always kept his bearing around him that he was Harry Truman of Independence, Missouri. And I really admire him. The man you probably never heard of. His name is George Wyth. W-Y-T-H-E is the last choice. name. And uh, he, he, you can still see his home in Williamsburg, Virginia. One of the most original historic buildings, historic homes you will find anywhere in the country. So it's original, lots of material there. But I'll tell you why. He, there's a lot of reasons, but here's kind of what captures it. Taught both Thomas Jefferson and John, uh, John Marshall as a tutor 
in law when they were in Williamsburg, Virginia. And um, I love that because if you know anything about that era of history, Jefferson and, and Marshall were major rivals. Marshall being our first significant Supreme Court justice to really help shape the court. And Jefferson, of course, among other things, serving as president, um, as the third president. And they battled between the branches of government and they saw law very differently from each other. And I love that George Wythe can teach people that ended up to be rivals because that tells you that someone is so smart and so mm -hmm. good at teaching that they can disagree with each other and yet have learned rather than inculcating, rather than indoctrinating that you have to think like me. And to give you an idea of how well WIF was ex ex um, um, respected, if you look at the Declaration of Independence and you look at the signatures on there and you look at the section where the Virginians signed, they left the top spot open for George Wythe mm -hmm. because that's how much they respected him. Now, contrary to popular belief, they did not, the declaration was not all signed in one moment. They signed it over the course of several weeks after they passed the um, resolution for independence. Um, the Continental Congress, uh, the people that were there went home. And then they started to come back through Philadelphia over the se several weeks after and started to sign the Declaration of Independence. So it's not as ceremonial as the paintings portray. But the point is, as a result, they all signed at different times. Mm -hmm. And all the other Virginians happened to come there before Wythe got there, but they left that top spot open for George Wythe because they were so respectful of this person. The other reason I like him, just real quick, is his intellectual curiosity. He liked every darn topic out there. And if you know me, that's me. I don't like just history. I like a million other things. And I'm an incredibly curious person. That's why he's the most inspiring person to me in history. And he is a true person of the Enlightenment. Yes. Absolutely. Any other questions out there? Yes. Zella wants to know, any chance you might visit the Truman White House in Key West? Lots of stories in man meeting from there, I would guess. Yes. And we're... <laughs> One of the challenges we're having right now, if, you, if you're into family history, the 1950 census was released by the National Archives the 1st of April. And we are still, today is what, May 17th? 14th. 14th. We are still trying to find the Trumans in the 1950 census. And we're going to work with our friends at the, some, uh, the other Summer White House at Key West and try to solve that riddle. But that's another place where you can visit where Truman and his cabinet and family, they were able to escape a little bit the pressures of the presidency. It's a magical place. Now, as far as uh, if you're asking me, that's the sort of thing that I would do with the club. That's the sort of thing I would do with the club is if, if, if it takes, um, I go further, do more travel, that sort of thing I would do with Cleo the Muse club. So any chance the answer is yes. Do I have it on the docket? I don't. Um, but, you know, I do take requests for it. Any other questions? Um, I don't have a question, but Fanny has a comment. Yeah. Thank you, Ranger, for answering my question. It's interesting my that honor. your mom and dad were in the military during that era. I bet her stories are so amazing. Your father's stories are interesting as well, but the stories of women experiencing in the military during that time is often lost in history. Keep doing a great job, sir. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And again, congratulations, Rock. I can't thank you enough for that. That just means the world to me. Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to jump in on the video because we do hear you. I think that's All right, it. I think we're set. All right, everybody. Thank you again for coming on. I appreciate it. We're going to sign off here. Check out CleoTheMuse.tv so you can watch the show. It's free to access. Go and check it out. Nine episodes. Season two. <laughs>